Hello and welcome to Game Sack. Yes, it's another Left in Japan. In fact, it's our eighth episode. It's amazing. This has got to be our most popular series, isn't it? I mean, well, eight of them. Yeah. You guys like it. It's a hot topic. I want to do at least ten before Game Sack fizzles into oblivion. I think we should be able to do that. Okay. Anyway, we've got some cool games to talk about, so let's just take a look at them. Here's Zanke, battle riding for the Super Famicom. This game was released by Hudson Soft in 1995 and is one of the five different Zanke games. Three of them are on the Super Famicom and this one is by far the best one. It's an action platformer based on the manga and I know you won't believe me when I say this but I've never read it. It doesn't matter though as the Super Famicom got a fairly good game out of it. If you recall our PCFX episode, Joe reviewed a Zanke game called Zanke FX which was definitely one of the best games for the system. Well, this one was released first, and I guess Zanke likes to be in good games. Anyway, from what I can understand of the story, there's this girl named Cherry who summons Zanke to save her. What he's saving her from, I'm not sure, but I guess it's all the enemies that you fight while playing this game. Duh. Zanke starts out as a small, spunky kid. He's fairly useless when you control him, as he can only punch and kick, and jump, of course. After he fights and defeats a boss, you get a cutscene. Cherry comes in and shows Zanke her panties, and all of a sudden he's big and has powers. Well, at least her panties appear to be clean, so that's good. Big Zanky takes over from here, and this is where the fun begins. At first, I had some troubles controlling my character. All of his actions feel sluggish, especially jumping, and I'd miss platforms that look like I should have landed on. But as I played the game more, I got used to how the controls worked, and I started to have a lot of fun. Big Zanky has a lot more going for him than the little guy. He has a bunch of attack moves that are hugely useful. He can do punching combos by button mashing. He has a cool electrical projectile thing. And my favorite is this tornado move. These are just to name a few. Another thing that he has in his arsenal is this nuke type attack. This attack uses magic that you collect and is displayed in the upper right corner. Upper right corner! It's so awesome because it does a ton of damage, but it's so bad because it takes a ton of your life bar. That's why you'll probably never use it. The stages are fairly long with lots of enemies to kill and even some hidden items in the hidden areas to find. As you make your way through a level, there's shrines for you to open which contain helpful items. Once you reach the end of a level, there's a force field blocking the exit. To clear the force field, you have to go back through the level to open all the shrines that have popped up out of nowhere. This might seem a bit tedious, but it's actually kind of fun. Yeah, you see a lot of the same parts of a level, but new pathways usually open up and it's up to you to find them. Once you find and open all the shrines, go back to the force field and it will open up and a boss fight awaits you. At first, the boss fights seem tough, but once you figure out their weakness and their pattern, they become absurdly simple. I bought this game from a friend a long time ago when he was selling a bunch of his collection. I picked up this box and the two screenshots that I saw I couldn't believe. <laughs> the graphics were beyond the Super Nintendo, I thought. I still think that as this game is stunning to look at. The outside levels have layers upon layers of seamless scrolling and it looks amazing. I could soak in these graphics all day long. It'd be easy too because the game has a soundtrack that almost matches the graphics. Lots of quality tunes that are very enjoyable and just enhance your experience. It's too bad that no Zinky games were ever brought out to the West. Even if the license was causing issues, they could have just changed the game's name and characters. Still, play this game if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Let's check out a Super Smash Bros. ripoff called Dream Mix TV World Fighters on the PlayStation 2. A lot of people suggested this back in our copycat game episode for its similarity to the Nintendo franchise. And they were not kidding. There's lots of different franchises in here. Hell, check out this crazy licensing screen. You've got up to four players battling it out all at once in what can really be best described as pure chaos. You have a decent roster of characters to choose from, including the likes of Simon Belmont and Optimus Prime. Oh hell, like I'm gonna choose any other character than Optimus Prime. Actually, I did try Simon Belmont, but he's only okay and it's easy for him to get lost in the backgrounds. In fact, I'd say the only two characters that aren't impossible to keep track of are Optimus Prime and Twinbee. I guess you can unlock Megatron, which is cool, but that requires beating the game with a whole bunch of other characters that really are hard for me to keep track of on the screen. Anyway, the premise is that you all share the same meter at the bottom of the screen. Once a character gets to the empty portion of the meter, they'll lose their soul heart or whatever it is and they'll shrink. If another character grabs it, then you stay small and lose the match, though you can still fight if it's a three player match or more. But you can also grab your escaped soul heart and grow back to normal size. 
That's pretty cool, I like that. Once you grab all of the enemy's soul hearts, you win the match. To me, this is less confusing than how Smash Bros. works with its weird percentages, but granted, I haven't really played that series very much. You only have a few different moves you can do. A punch, a grab, and a special. You can also do a special version of the punch move as well. The specials are fun and are of course unique to each character. Despite the simple controls, I wish I could say that they were more effective. Sometimes it feels like they don't register, but that might be due to the animation of each attack. That means your attacks happen slightly later than you expect them to. The visuals are a mixed bag. I like that each character has their own stage designed around their theme like Devastator here in Optimus Prime stage. I mean Devastator is Prime's enemy, but he's still a Transformer so that fits. Not sure why he's not moving though, he should be trying to pound Prime with his fists. And everyone else for that matter, I mean he's Devastator. Anyway, the stages all scale out when the fighters get far apart and this makes it really tough to see your characters because they are so tiny. Sometimes the characters even get hidden behind the bar at the bottom. This game doesn't support either 480p or widescreen so that makes it even tougher to see what's going on. The music is also a mixed bag. It's mostly forgettable but I do like some of the character themes like Simon's. The sounds are all annoying as hell. With as much noise as these characters are making you think they're having a discussion instead of a battle. And they all have a lot to say. Each and every move must be announced. And does it seem wrong to anyone else that Optimus Prime sounds like a very, very angry Japanese man? Optimus Prime is not really a character that I associate extreme anger with. I imagine this stayed in Japan simply due to the licensing nightmare that would need to be resolved to bring this out anywhere else. Overall, it's not a bad game, I just think it could be better. Still, where else can you have Optimus Prime fight Simon Belmont? I mean, just for that, the game gets a thumbs up. Here's Getsu Fumaden or Getsu Fu Maiden for the Famicom by Konami. I'm not sure which spelling is correct as I've seen it written both ways. To me it really doesn't matter how it's spelled just as long as it's a solid game and a fun experience. When we went to Retropalooza in 2015, a fan of ours recommended this game and wow, I'm glad you did. Thank you, random GameSack fan. I can see your face in my memory, but I forgot your name. Sorry, bud. Well, I'll say it right from the start that this is a good game. Another thing that I'll say right away is that there is a fan translation out there. I played it in its original Japanese text and I made a really great start not knowing what's going on story-wise. After I played a couple hours, I kind of got stuck wondering what to do next. But it's still great fun despite that. Anyways, you start the game off on an overhead world and you basically just follow the path in the only direction you can go. As you make your way, you'll come across Japanese style gates. You can't get around these and once you touch them, you're transported to a side-scrolling action level. These levels are fun and are typically very short. Seriously, most of them take less than two minutes to get through. These levels are easy to traverse and are loaded with enemies and lots of platforming. Once you reach the end of these levels, you go back to the overworld map and continue on the direction you're headed. It's kind of set up similar to the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle game on the NES which preceded this with its overhead and side-scrolling levels. Anyways, these gates are all over the map so get used to them. But don't worry, they're fun to play and your character controls really well so just enjoy it. Probably the best thing about these levels is the variety in backgrounds and enemies. It's quite refreshing to see so much variety in each of these when there are so many of these levels present. So besides these action levels, there's other icons that you can interact with on the overworld. There's this hut looking thing where I'm guessing you get advice from a couple of different demons on what you need to do to proceed. This is really where I wish I'd played the English version. Then there's this other icon which is a shop. Just buy everything that you can in these shops because it'll eventually help you out. And if you don't have enough money it's not a big deal. Just go back into any of the action sequences and you can farm money and health from the respawning enemies. If you find a good spot then it won't take long to have thousands in gold. So just go back and buy everything you can. Like this shop here sells a sword and you'll definitely need it because in the action sequences it can break stones and walls so you can reach the other side of a level. Then there's a candle that you buy in one of the shop that is really helpful in the third person dungeon. The first time I stumbled upon this dungeon it was dark and naturally thought about the candle that I bought. Lo and behold it magically lit all the torches when I used it. 
The 3D dungeon that I played was slightly confusing, and even though I found the end okay, I still felt like there was something that I was missing. I went through it a couple of times, but still left with an empty feeling. I'm glad to see these levels mixed in here, and they do add to the fun factor. Sure, there's no smooth scaling, and navigating can be disorienting with no map, but I still like the change in gameplay. This is seriously a good time from Konami. And to top it off, it has some really catchy music. The overworld tune stands out, and there were many times that I would just let my characters sit there without moving so I could listen to the music. I'm sad that this never came out in the West, and surprised Konami didn't bring it out under their Ultra label, or Palcom for you Europeans. Nintendo limited how many games each publisher could release in a given year. Maybe Ultra filled up all their slots too. We'll never know. Anyway, do yourself a favor and try this game out. Alright, we're back, and those three games were pretty good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm pissed off that some of them, like the Zanke, never yeah. came out in the I U.S. Mean, really? I mean, look at the graphics on that thing. Just beautiful to look at, and it's actually a pretty fun game. So, And we've got another game that I'm going to cover right now on the Saturn, mm -hmm. which also has really good graphics that most of you probably wouldn't want to play, but I think <laughs> it's fun anyway, so let's just get to it. This is Nanatsu Kaze no Shima Monogatari for the Sega Saturn by Enix. Enix says this means seven blasts of the wind in island story. Seven blasts of wind, huh? It's almost too easy to make a joke out of that. The goal of this game is to uncover the seven different winds on this large, seemingly floating island. You're Gapu, a weird, fat, green creature with tiny little wings. You can't fly with those wings, though. You start out hatching from an egg, and you've already got a satchel around you. Anyway, you're left to figure things out from here. This is a 2D adventure game where you need to find and use items to access new areas. And there's never really a fear of dying or losing. There also doesn't seem to be a time limit of any kind. Just about everything here is in Japanese. You can use a walkthrough, but there is some text entry here and there, so you'll probably have to know a bit of katakana. You can use an online katakana guide, but the fonts in this game don't make it tremendously easy. Still, it's usually not a big deal, as all you really need to do most of the time is just press start to confirm what's already filled out for you. The menu system will definitely take a lot of getting used to, but once you understand how it's laid out, it's really not that bad at all. So you wander around from screen to screen investigating things and talking to other creatures. Eventually, you'll get a green horn. And you use this to wake up this giant ass dude here, and he'll give you a bug catcher. You wander around catching some of the little things that hop around and add them to your inventory. And if you give the giant dude the right creature, he gives you the blue horn. I'm assuming that each horn is one of the different winds, but don't quote me on that. It makes sense to me, though. Eventually, you'll have helper creatures following you around. Blow the blue horn, and this little blue dude will cut down the obstacles in your path so you can get by. This stupid purple dinosaur guy seems to have a big problem with me. He's always challenging me to stupid duels. Of course, I always win. He's also really cruel to this poor little rabbit-like creature. Poor guy or girl. And you'll run into him a lot at this part of the game. Eventually, as you wander around, you'll see that he tied the red creature up to a rock so he or she couldn't escape. If you use the blue horn, the little scissors guy will cut the rope and now she or he is your friend. Now if you blow the red horn, that creature will follow you around. It'll carry you over obstacles and you have a limited amount of flight to help explore even more. Overall, I think you get the basic idea of how the game works. It's divided up into chapters, and after each one is over, you get to read the story up to that point. Honestly, the game is pretty slow for the most part. You do eventually get the ability to run, but it really doesn't help speed things up much. This is a slow game for patient people, but seriously, that doesn't mean it's a bad game. Not at all. In fact, I enjoyed it quite a lot, despite the language barrier. The hand-drawn graphics are all amazing, and the animation is really cool, too. But at the same time, it can be kind of creepy. I mean, look at this weird ass face talking to you. There's not much in the way of music and even the sound is really sparse. Seriously, you might want to turn down the audio a little bit because the footsteps and stuff can get kind of annoying to listen to. It really is no wonder that this was never released outside of Japan. For one, it's not chock full of polygons. Also, it probably didn't help that Enix didn't support the Saturn in the US. 
And of course, no one else wanted to publish it because it probably wouldn't have sold very well. There's been some interest in the hacking community lately to translate this one, and it'd be cool if they did it. I can't really recommend this one unless you know or are learning Japanese, however. But I fit in neither of those categories, and I was still able to get some enjoyment out of it. This is Robert Mondu for the PlayStation. It's the third entry in the Jumping Flash series of games. Did you know that Jumping Flash got a third game? I didn't for a long time. Anyway, I was a little curious as why it was called Robert Mondu instead of Jumping Flash 3, but after playing I can certainly understand why. The game flows nothing like the first two games. In the first two titles, there's a certain number of worlds, each with two sublevels in a boss fight. In this game you have a map and you can choose which mission you'd like to do, so it's a bit more free in that sense. You still control Robin in a first-person perspective, and he controls just like he always has, and that's good. He can still shoot missiles at his enemies, and he can still shoot a special weapon. The special weapon has been changed, though. You only get one per level, whereas before you could have up to three at a time, and you could keep getting them as you play. So all is good with the controls, but the problem to me is that the game doesn't seem as meaty. It doesn't have as much substance to it as the first two titles. It's not a bad thing, but when you're expecting more of the same stuff that made the previous game so fun, it feels like a letdown. I mean, take a look at some of these ridiculous levels. This one has you jumping off a high dive, navigating through rings and landing on a platform. It's simple and very boring. Or how about this one where you're shooting a mole or whatever this is to save a carrot patch. This level is a total snore fest, but luckily it's over quickly. The game is loaded with filler levels like this, and the bad thing is that you do them more than one time throughout the story. Granted, things do change inside the level, but you're still doing the same thing and it's just irritating. The game isn't all bad though, and there are more than a few levels that feel like the older games. Levels that are wide open and you can traverse back and forth completing whatever it is that you're supposed to do. These bigger levels have different objectives, like this one where you have to kill all the ghosts. It was as simple as can be since the ghosts don't fight back, but I really enjoyed the atmosphere and the music. Another decently fun level is this one where you go down a well. It's a small maze down here and it's not even remotely difficult, but it's still kind of fun. I really like the effect when you jump in and out of the water, and again it has some decent music. There's a few other things going on in this game that I don't understand. You can collect and buy cards. What these do for you I have no idea, but I feel that there's more to them than just collecting them. In the end, do I hate this game? No, I don't hate it, but I am a bit disappointed at the end result. The first two games didn't sell like crazy in the West, and that's likely the reason this one wasn't released here. But if it was released in the US back in the day, I would have bought it since I really liked the series. Then I probably would have sold it as that's the kind of idiot I was back then. Oh well, I've played it and I'm content now knowing that I didn't really miss out as this game is fun but not amazing. Okay, this one is called Battles of Kaden, and it's for the Super Famicom. I know, it's probably pronounced Battles of Kuaden, but I think Battles of Kaden sounds way better. Pronouncing Japanese words Spanish style is what I do. Anyway, this one is a single plane beat em up style game. You can choose from one of three girls, but it's only a single player game. Now, I'm not sure what the story is, but I assume some bad guys are around, and it's up to the player maybe to save the day? Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. That's all you need to know. The gameplay is pretty interesting. There are some Street Fighter style moves that you can pull off that are pretty damned effective. You also have a magic move that's accessed by simply pressing the X button and it damages all the enemies on screen. These of course are specific to each character. And you've got a limited number of them so be careful. After fighting enemy after enemy you'll eventually level up. This basically extends your life bar and trust me you're gonna be needing it. This game can be tough because the enemies never stop coming. Granted, there's only ever two enemies on the screen at once, kind of like NES beat-em-ups, but they come quickly and they never seem to stop. You can also power up your magic which not only makes it stronger, but also lets you use it more times before running out. The stages themselves are pretty basic. Just keep moving to the right for the most part. Sometimes there's platforms you can jump up to and down from, and occasionally there's a bottomless pit you need to jump over. But honestly, that's about as complex as the stages get. Unfortunately, the stages are quite long and they get tiresome after a bit. Weirdly though, stage 3 is super short. 
There's not a huge variety of enemies and it can get kind of repetitive, but you know, that's par for the course with beat em ups. And if any of them can kick my ass, it's these pig guys. They are tough. And these guys with the hats usually hurt me when they first enter, but I get them quick enough. And what the hell, are they sending baby apes into battle? Fortunately, they're just as easy to defeat as human babies. Control wise, everything feels responsive and there's nothing really to get frustrated about. Well, actually there is a bit of slowdown here and there, especially in this level with fire. You can really feel it. The game looks pretty nice. The characters are all very large and that's probably why only two enemies can fit on the screen at once. And don't get me wrong, I'm okay with that. I don't wanna fight three at once, no way. Also, there's plenty of good use of color and the scrolling is pretty nice in spots. The sound and music is for the most part pretty good. It's mostly an Eastern Asian style and it definitely fits. In fact, I really like the theme in stage two. The sound can be weird sometimes though because reverb will randomly kick in here and there for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Wait 30 seconds and it goes away. I'm not sure if this is intentional or if it's just a bug. I'm also not sure why this game didn't get a simple translation and come out in the West. I mean, it seems like it would be pretty easy to localize. I think it would have been a good addition to the Super Nintendo library. The good news is that as of right now, there are lots of copies available and they're pretty cheap. That's good because you really don't want to spend a ton on this one. Overall, it's a pretty good game if a little drawn out in places. All right, you guys, there you have it, episode eight, and it is in the books. Indeed, it's almost over, but not completely over. Yes. We have post-credit skits. Yes, that they're not know. usually very good. Well, Please. some people like them. Well, they do, but they're, yes. you know, like the one for this episode is probably not going to be very good. Yeah, probably because we haven't even thought about it yet. That's true. So. <laughs> but anyway, well, it might be good. It's we'll not going to be good unless we think about it. You know, we're going to have to think about it after we're done talking. Yeah, so stop. But anyway... Uh, what, what do you guys think of these games that we talked about in this episode? Um, mm -hmm. You know, give us more suggestions for the next two episodes we hope to do yes, before yeah. GameSack fizzles into oblivion. Yes. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Hello and welcome to Game Sack. Game Sack, yo! Anyway, this is Left in Japan. It's actually the eighth episode we've done in the series so far. Number eight! Number eight, yo! Anyway, we're talking about more games that have only ever been released in Japan, never anywhere else. No, man, nowhere else but Japan, yo! What the hell are you doing? Dude, I'm adding the two that people want in our show, yo. I suggest you get on the train. Think our show needs some two? Yeah, man, let's try it again. Okay, let's start over. Yeah. Hello, welcome to GameSack, y'all! Yo, GameSack bitches! This is Left in Japan number 